Hey guys, in today's video, I'm going over a complete step-by-step -step guide on how I make backing tracks for the bands that I perform with. So I've done a ton of videos on backing tracks on this channel, gear, apps, tutorials, opinions, but I've never really gone over step-by-step -step how I do them. These are the actual steps that I go through when I'm making backing tracks for my bands that I perform with. So a few things right off the bat, I do original music and cover music. Both of them use backing tracks. In this video, I'm going to show you how I do it with covers. However, this same idea can be applied if you're doing it with original music as well. Second, I'm personally going to be demoing this of how I run my tracks from an iPad, but you can do this from a phone or another tablet as well. However, even if you do plan to use a laptop for your backing tracks, you can still follow along with this video and get tips and advice about how to do backing tracks. I've made over 200 backing tracks with this method, so I've got you know my rhythm down for this, and this is the method that I've settled on. Feel free to use this as a starting point for you to give you some ideas. You don't have to follow this exactly cater this to fit your own needs. But hopefully at some point in this video, you'll go, oh, I didn't even think about that. And it'll help you out. Also, this video is long, way longer than I intended it to be. But I wanted to really go into detail about this because one, I wanted to help you guys out to prevent making some of the same mistakes that I did when I first started using tracks. And secondly, I didn't just want to say here's how I do it and not give any context to it. I want to explain why I do things a certain way. And then hopefully it gives you the aha moment. I didn't even think about that. That's a way better way to do this. So yes, you're looking at the time code. Yes, that's really how long this video is. But before we get started, my channel is a music tech channel, tips, gear reviews, programming, stuff like that. I do gear giveaways on this channel. If you're interested in seeing more videos like this in the future, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to ring the bell to be notified when I put out new videos. And hitting the thumbs up button is a free way to support the channel. And also just FYI, if you don't want to do all of this, I have been hired by other people locally or you know, just through email and Zoom to do all these steps for you. So if you are interested in just having me create these backing tracks for you, you can find out more on my website at scottyulemusic.com slash consulting. If all of this sounds like too much work, you can hire me to do that, just FYI. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so first step is you're going to have to get the backing tracks or produce the backing tracks that you will be using live. If you have original music, you'll basically just have to get the stems from you know your studio or something like that of all the keyboard parts or synth parts or 808 parts or whatever you want to include in your backing tracks. You need to get those as stems. I've produced my own music, so that's very easy for me to do. You might have to hit up a studio in order to do that. But for covers, most of the time, I don't know about you guys, but I'm doing pretty common songs. How many times have I played Uptown Funk and Don't Stop Believing and Sweet Home Alabama? I, more times than I can count. There are websites where you can get these stems for popular songs. So unless if you're doing a super B-side track from Foghat, you should be able to find most of these stems available online. They'll either be remixes or karaoke versions. Sometimes you can actually find the actual stems from the actual studio sessions. So you have two choices when you do this. You can either produce the backing tracks yourself, or you can go to one of these sites, pay a small fee and get all these stems. That's really up to you. I personally have just decided to use some of these sites. The site that I use is karaokeversion.com. You can find almost every track that you're looking for and it's just $3 a track. Okay, so go to the site that you're going to get the tracks from. Again, I'm going to karaoke-version.com and you can search for the song that you want. For this video, I'm gonna be doing Everybody by Backstreet Boys, just because there's a lot going on in the song and it made sense for this demo of the things I wanna show you. So you can see here, you can find the song and click it and it'll cost $3 to buy. $3 a song saves me so much time, it's worth it in my opinion. So with this site, you can see you can download individual parts of a song. So over here, you can either mute parts or you can solo parts and listen to it if you don't know exactly what they are and it gives you a little preview. So this one is like this great gray section right here is the preview. So for example, if I don't know what the synth pad sounds like, I can solo that, hit play. If I want to know what the synth strings sounds like, and so on and so forth. But first, the three main stems that I get, I get the click, the drums, not percussion, that's separate. I get click, drums, bass, backing vocals, and lead vocals as my main five stems that I get first. It's a Backstreet Boys song, so obviously I have multiple singers. So most of the time it just says lead vocals as one track. In this case, it has three. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna download the click, the drums, the bass, the backing vocals, and the lead vocals all as separate stems. Sometimes it takes a little while to download, sometimes it's pretty quick. 
And again, for this one, there's three lead vocals. I'm just gonna mute everything else and download the three vocals as one. So now you can see I have five different tracks downloaded. You might be like, well, why do you have lead vocals and drums and bass in the track if you're not going to use them in your track? I'll get to that in a little bit. So now from here, I go to download other stuff. So if you wanna go really crazy with it, you can download every stem individually if you want. I personally, so like piano, synthesizer, synth pad, synth strings, synth keys, and orchestra hits, those are all kind of keyboard parts. If the synth strings are really that loud, I'll come back and re-download it. And you can also change the volume here if you need to. So that's always an option as well. And again, I'm downloading them all as a group because they basically serve the same idea. Synthesizers, strings, piano, all of that I consider just keyboard parts. Now, there are different ones I've seen. So percussion, I always get by itself. That's always one that I always do an individual track for. I like having control over that. And then anytime it says sound effects or noise effects or something random like that, sometimes those can be really annoying in the song. Sometimes it can be really helpful. So I usually download that one by itself. So I wanna make sure that I'm able to remove the parts that are annoying and save the parts that are really helpful. So this song in particular actually doesn't have any guitar in it. You know, I still perform guitar when I perform live with this song, but there's no guitar backing tracks with it. However, if there is a song that does have guitar, you know, I'm a guitar player, obviously we don't need the guitar in the tracks. However, my personal preference is that I like to add a little bit of guitar in like choruses or bridges or solos, usually not in verses, but just a little bit, you know, like power chords or bigger chords just to kind of thicken up the sound when it gets to a bigger part of the song, like the bridge or the chorus. I'm still playing guitar live. I just like a tiny bit of guitar in there to kind of boost the sound and make it sound just a little bit bigger. The difference between ordinary and extraordinary is that little extra. So if a track has guitar in it, I oftentimes will download this one that says like distorted guitar or something like that. Obviously, if it says lead guitar, that's usually like a guitar solo, and I don't want that in the backing track, but I'll download like the distorted guitar, and then I'll trim out, you know, delete parts of the verse and delete parts in the bridge if I don't think we need it, and just leave the parts in the chorus and the solo to just thicken up the sound just a tiny bit, and obviously mixed it down a little bit more. Again, it's just to augment the sound, it's not meant to replace my guitar playing. Another thing that I found when doing these is like piano and violin, especially with like country songs. I don't do lead solos in the backing track. So what happens is instead of the violin solo, I actually just play those solos on guitar because we don't have a fiddle player. This is the same is true with piano. Sometimes there'll be a piano solo, but there's also piano in the verses. So I do want to have separate control over those parts. So the piano or the violin, I will download separately if there are lead parts that I don't want in the song, but I want to leave other parts in the song. Solos I will delete, parts in the verse I will keep in it. Okay, so these are my stems that I have downloaded. So it tells you what the tempo is right here. Sometimes it'll say variable around a certain tempo, but if it says it's the same as the original tempo, that means that's exactly what the tempo is. So I like to add that at the end of the click track. So I'll put 10806 so that I know what the tempo of the song is. So now I'm going to import them into Logic. You can use any DAW for this you want. So if you prefer Pro Tools or Cubase or Ableton, well, that's fine. But I do have a template saved for this. So what you wanna do is you wanna make a track for everything that you're going to drop in here, obviously. Saving a template does save time. So I know I'm always gonna have drum, bass, tracks, backing vocals and click. I'll address these three here later in a minute, but I know those are those are always gonna be there. This one has a couple more tracks. So I'll, you know, I'll duplicate it. And this is percussion and this is sound effects here. So I know that those are extra ones. So first you actually want to set the tempo for the song. So this one is 108.06. Even if the tempo is listed at variable around, you know, 108, I still put it at what tempo it's close to just cause it makes it easier to move stuff around if I need to. So yeah, now just drag them in. So now everything is dropped in. So here's the important thing, is you want everything that is going to be the backing tracks, which will go to front of house to be mixed, what the audience is gonna hear, you're gonna pan all of those all the way to the left. And everything that's going to your ears, even if it's just your drummer who's gonna be hearing the click, you're gonna pan anything that goes to your ears to the right. So you can see all my tracks are panned to the left and all of my stuff that's going to go to my ears, to my in-ears for the musicians to hear, 
what the audience won't hear is panned to the right. Again, this is gonna make sense here in a little bit, and I'll show you why the lead vocals are in here, but obviously you want the click to go to your in-ears. Again, these three, I will address them here in a minute, just go with me. Even if you don't plan to use drums or bass in the tracks, I still like to have them in there just to get a better feel of how the song is gonna sound with backing tracks, and then obviously I'll mute them when I don't need them anymore. Those are the rhythm foundations of the song. It's easier to mix kind of if you have just a general idea of how they sound together. Just my personal preference, you don't have to do it. Okay, so the method that I do for this is the easiest method where you just have one file, MP3 or WAV file, and it runs from a tablet or a phone or even a computer if you want to. But you use a splitter cable. So the splitter cable, it has a 3.5 millimeter on one side and then has two TS cables on the other side. So what it's doing is it's getting a stereo file from your iPad and then all the tracks and everything that goes to the audience for the audience to hear is panned to the left and then everything that you want to hear in your in-ears, so the click track and cues and stuff like that, that you don't want the audience to hear is panned to the right. That's why there's two cables is that you can split the signal. One contains all the tracks and one contains all of your click and cues. This cold, I don't know if you guys can hear it. I can't stand hearing myself talk right now with my cold. So I apologize if that's gonna drive you nuts. So when people hear that, a lot of people ask, well, does that mean that the left side of the stage is going to have tracks and everyone who's sitting on the right side of the venue is not gonna hear it? Or am I only gonna hear click in my right earbud? No, that's not how this works. If that does happen in your setup, I do have a video on that that you can watch that will explain how to fix that problem. Most of the time it doesn't happen, but if you do run into that problem, this is why, and watch that video. But using this method, the thing is, is that it will give you a mono backing track. For me personally, every band that I play in, we use mono backing tracks. My 90s cover band, my band with my wife, the corporate band that I play in, the wedding band that I play in, and even my artsy, weird, surreal, original music, Every band that I play in, we use mono backing tracks. I personally think they sound fine, completely usable. I haven't had a complaint from it. Most sound guys actually are like, hey man, your tracks sound really good. It's really up to you. Using this way with mono is much easier and less complicated to set up. If you must have stereo, you're gonna either need to use a computer that has at least three outputs from an interface, or with an iPad, you also need to get an interface with at least three outputs. You'll have to have left and right for stereo track, so that's two, and then you need another output for click and cues to go to your ears. So I did do a video on an app called Multitracker, which does allow multi-track outputs from an iPad, so you can multi-track out 18 separate signals if you really want that kind of a separation. That is much more complicated. For this one, I'm just doing a mono track, and this is how I've done it in all of my bands. It works for me. It's up to you if you wanna go that extra distance. If you really do want to figure out how to do that, watch the video on multi-tracker, and that should help you out. Okay, so now I start doing some editing. So the first thing that I do, I actually don't like the sound of their click. So I don't know why, but my screen capture of my computer screen for some reason doubled the audio in Logic. So it might sound a little bit off. It'll sound like it's doubled. It doesn't actually sound like that. That was just my screen capture for some reason. It's actually not bad. I personally just like having more control over my click. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click the track. It gives you an audio file and the shortcut Control D is going to convert that into MIDI. This is good for doing for drums, especially for click, it's very easy. They have different stuff in here. I always just do it normally and it's completely fine. And now what it's done is it's given me the click, but as MIDI right here. And you can see they have the accents right here. Very important, after you've done the bounce here, it does put it to the center. Make sure that goes to the right, because otherwise, if you have this centered, that means the audience is gonna hear this click sound. You don't want that. So it's actually a good habit right away before you do anything else, pan it to the right so you don't forget that. I made that mistake one time, never again. So now it sounds like this, which is obviously what I don't want. So what I do is, I go to the sampler right here, and this is where you can load your own sound. So one of the bands that I play in, they have this click, so I just this is just the one that I use. Having different click sounds with different songs can be very distracting. So I try to use just one sound for a click throughout all of the songs. Now it sounds like this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna click right here, and the non-accent ones, whoop, 
And this is actually a good point. You see how when I moved it down, it kind of like moved around a little bit. So actually the way you do it is you select everything and then hit option down to move it all together without having to worry about human error. But what I want to do is I want to have this one, the, the accents go up here. So I have the accents on D and then the non accents on B. But how do I select all of these? I mean, that would take forever to go through here and do that, right? There's actually a shortcut as you hit Shift C and it selects all of them of a very similar velocity. And again, option up is the way to move them all. So I'm gonna scroll through. It's not gonna grab all of them, but watch. If I do Shift C again, it found all the other ones. Here's another one. Shift C, move it up. I mean, this saves so much time and it only takes like, you know, maybe 10 seconds to do the whole thing. So yeah, now all of them are up like that. And that's the sound that I want. Now, the last thing that I do is I'm going to hit Command A to select all of them. I'm going to set my secondary tool to the velocity tool. And if you hold Command and Option and you drag them all up, you can get them all to be at 100% velocity, which is what you want, because you want them to be, you know, loud enough for you guys to hear it. So that's the sound that I have now. I just like having control over my click sounds. Okay, now click is set up. You can delete the audio file if you want. I usually do. Okay, so the next thing, and this is actually one of the most important things to do, is that with all of the tracks here, you need to bounce them down into a mono track. So you might be asking, why do I need to do this? Well, some of these, so for example, the backing vocals, they'll have the third pan to the left, and then they'll have the fifth pan to the right. Th if this is a stereo file and you pan it to the left, that means you are just going to hear the third and the fifth is not going to come through and be heard. Same is true for keyboard parts. They'll put like strings on the left and then synthesizer on the right. So if you just pan it to the left as a stereo file, that means you will just hear the strings. However, if you bounce it down to mono, it sums both of them together. So now you have the fifth and the third together. When you pan it to the left, you now can hear both of them since it's a mono file. So the way that you do that, and this is a little complicated, I have a video on this, but in Logic, you set these two buttons right here, you set it to from its stereo or mono, you set it to mono, you set the output to mono output and this everyone's is going to be a little bit different my apollo twin gives me part of stereo output but this is actually just output one so now it's output one you can see it's now there's no panning available and then what you want to do is you want to bounce in place and now it gives you a mono track both the left and the right summed together so i'm going to delete the stereo track i'm going to push this back to a stereo track and it gives me the ability to pan and I'm going to pan that all the way to the left. If I went over that too quickly for you, watch the video again or watch my independent video about how to convert stereo to mono in Logic Pro X. So you want to do that for basically everything. So the tracks I always do it for and the backing vocals especially I always do it for because again, you can see these waveforms are a little bit different. So again, I'm going to follow these steps, set this to mono output bounce in place the shortcut for that is control b if you do want to use that and again it will bounce it out to a mono sound it will sum the left and the right to a mono sound so i'm going to delete this one set this back and pan it back if you plan to do this with stereo tracks you don't need to do this you actually you actually would want them as stereo but if you're doing my easy method you do want them as mono so i'm going to do the same thing for percussion and the same thing for sound effects. And when it's done, again, don't forget, you gotta make sure your panning is correct. So now the tracks, percussion, sound effects, and the backing vocals are set as mono, but panned all the way to the left. If you do have drum or bass in your backing tracks, most of the time you don't have to do this. I mean, you can see the waveforms are almost the exact same left and right, especially on bass. That's hardly ever a stereo bass, but just check the waveform and if there's no harm in doing it if you want to. Now that everything is set up, correctly so i have my click set up tracks bounced to mono and panned the correct way now you start making edits so for example if i don't like the sound effects here if i'm like i don't care for these this part those are kind of annoying. <laughs> that doesn't sound very good. So I would remove that from the song. This song, actually, I don't know if you've heard the full version of this song. It has this long drum 
section right here, I trim that out live. I don't personally want to do that. So, you know, I would make edit. This is actually one of the frustrating things about this is that it doesn't bounce out exactly to on the downbeat. So what I do is I zoom in really far, but I'm gonna hit Command A to select everything, and I'm gonna trim it basically right to here, and I'm gonna move it all the way up. Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to move this over to start on measure three, because this is gonna be what you use as a count in. I give myself a two measure click to come in, one measure to say the name of the song, and then one measure to cue everybody in. Now we need to click at the beginning. So what I'll do now is I will take an extra two measures of it, I'll hold option and drag it over here. And I do have to listen to it to make sure that it lines up. So that's, that's right on time. So I do like to give myself an extra two measures at the beginning. So now I'm gonna chop out this long intro. So now that's how I want it to sound. So now the rest of this, this is up to you on what you want to do. Everyone is gonna be different on their preferences. This is up to you to make these decisions. These are kind of the rules that I follow with though. Take them for what it's worth. One, no lead vocals or solo stuff. Any solos are done live by the musicians. If there's a song that has a violin solo, and we don't have a violin player, I mute the violin for that part, and I perform a guitar solo instead of the violin. There's no lead vocals in the backing tracks. Again, I know this is down here, and it's panned to our ears. Not The audience is not going to hear this. This would be the audience. This is what goes to your ears. I'll address that here in a minute. So guitars are only in choruses, bridges, or solos anytime it needs to be thickened up. And again, it's not that loud. It's just to give it a little bit more power. The only backing vocals that I use are for like pop stuff. I'll, I'll mix it a little bit louder. So the track for Cake by the Ocean is going to have more backing vocals in it than say a Stone Temple Pilots song. Stone Temple Pilots song would probably actually have zero backing vocals in it. Some people like to have it for, you know, every harmony in there. I, I personally don't like that. I put in just a tiny bit just to thicken up choruses and stuff like that. And again, even if I do have them in there, it's at like negative 20. Those are the main rules that I follow. Personally, you make your own decisions. Be your own person, do what you want to do. Finally, the mystery of these three parts down here are going to be answered for you. Obviously, the click going to your ears, that makes a lot of sense. What is this piano track doing here? This is an instrument track. So what I'll actually do is for a song where the vocals start without any sort of pitch reference, I will put a piano note in here, just in case the vocals need to start a song so that I can give them a pitch. This song starts with just a swell. This is what the vocals hear. I guess you have the dun 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 dun. If the only thing the vocals heard was you know, this sweep, they would have no pitch reference. So the song's in B flat minor, so I would put in a B flat minor chord here. So what the, what the singer hears now is... So they can hear their pitch before the song starts. It's incredibly helpful if the vocals need to start a song. Obviously, this will only work if your singer is on in-ears. So if it's just your drummer on in-ears, this isn't necessary. But maybe in the future, your singer will have in-ears, so it might be worth it just to do it anyways. Okay, working our way down. Lead vocals for cues and cues. These work together. So the lead vocal is the actual lead vocal line. Oh my God, we're back again. So what, what is the point of having that in there? Obviously, I don't want the lead vocals on the tracks or just to be going through our ears. So why are we doing this? Well, there's two reasons. So first of all, this cues part down here, this is where I'm going to give cues for the musicians. So at the beginning, I'm going to say, everybody, drums in, ready, go. And then, you know, right here, I'm going to cue the vocals. Vocals in, go. And then the vocals sing. Verse one, ready, go, right here. Chorus, go, right here. Then at the end of the song, I'll say, I'll say stop on one, three, four, stop. And everyone knows when to stop and stuff like that. So this is really up to you on how much information or how many cues you want to put in your songs. If you just do, you know, shorter sets, you know, half hour, 45 minutes to an hour, you have the same, you know, 12 songs that you play almost every show with a slight alterations, you probably don't need to go that crazy with all of these cues. Just the name of the song to make sure that everyone's on the same page, maybe when to start and when to end the song, or maybe even just for like a complicated bridge part or something like that that's really long. I did a fill-in gig with a country band somewhat recently, and you know, their backing tracks, they just cued just the name of the song and then just everyone knew the structure and you didn't have to have any other cues. It didn't say verse two, verse three, 
anything like that was included. However, one of the songs, it did have this really long instrumental break in there, and they would say, okay, fiddle, go, banjo, go, drummer, come in, vocals, come back in to the chorus now, or something like that. So you can leave it just as simple or as complicated as you want. However, often I play three to four hours a night, and I like to have all of those cues in there. I do not need them. Trust me, I know the structure of Uptown Funk. I don't need help remembering how Uptown Funk goes. I've played that song so many damn times. But I do still like to have those structure cues in there, and mostly for three different reasons. One, if you do lose your place, you know, it's really important that you get back on the backing track. If you lose your spot in verse two, you listen for the cues of chorus in, ready, go, and then you can find your way back. Everybody makes mistakes, especially with, you know, a four hour night. If you lose your spot, at least everyone's able to get back on if by chance you do happen to lose your spot. Second reason I like to do this is if you have a fill-in player. I don't know about you guys, we often have fill-in players. We have a lot of musicians who play in a lot of different bands, so it's not always the same people for us. Having these cues, especially with a fill-in player, can be really helpful because then at least everyone starts together, important pauses you know, and rest in a song are hit, and everyone stops together. It's one of the most awkward things if not everybody stops together or not everyone starts together. You can miss like little fills and little rests and stuff you know, in the chorus or something like that. And it's not as big of a deal, but if everyone screws up like the ending, that's usually awkward. So with a fill-in player, I mean, obviously, hopefully your fill-in player has done the proper work, but just like remembering when to stop a song. I don't know if you guys have done, there's two songs that come to mind, Walking on Sunshine and Girls Just Wanna Have Fun. They go on for ever on the outro. So just having those cues, stop on one, three, four, stop, everyone knows when to end or keep going, this is the last one, stuff like that can be really helpful, especially for fill-in players. And then the third reason I like to have those cues in there, so my 90s cover band, we have about 200 songs. The band that I play with my wife, we have about 100 songs. There's a corporate you know, wedding band that I play with. I looked in our Dropbox, we have like 400 songs in there. Obviously, most of those we don't play very much anymore. So there's no way for me to rehearse every single one of those songs, but you know, I, I generally remember how they go. Having those cues in there can be really helpful of going, oh, is the verse twice this time? Is the solo four phrases or eight phrases? Just cues like that, especially for a song that you haven't done in a long time can be really helpful. Those are the reasons why I personally like to just have a good amount of cues in there. You don't have to overdo it. You'll find your pattern of what's too much and what's too little. That was just my two cents on why I do things the way that I do. Whatever clicked for you the most, I would say go with that for your band. Now I've recorded all my cues into the song. Here's what you know parts of it sound like. This is my actual session for everybody because we do play this song. Everybody, vocals in sing. Just drums and vocals, verse two. Instrumental bridge. Shitty bridge vocals, ready, go. So yeah, those are some of the actual cues that I have for this song. And now, this is the reason why I like to have the lead vocals in here. Why I like to have these in here while I'm recording. So my singers all have in-ears, and they will hear these cues. It can be incredibly distracting to say verse two, ready, go, while they are singing. So hearing the vocals, it really helps prevent that. I've done this before where I just say chorus in, ready, go, but you know, the vocals have to come in on beat three, so it's really distracting and doesn't even make sense. So let's look at the intro. So if I said vocals in, ready, go, it doesn't make sense because the lead vocals come in on beat four. Right? So instead for this one, I have it set where I just say vocals in, Go. Vocals in sing. Everybody. Or vocals in sing anyways. Because I don't want to, if I said vocals in ready sing, they would be singing on the word everybody. It wouldn't make sense. So that would be distracting. So I try to do this as best as I can to stay out of the way of the singers. That's why I like having this lead vocal in here. I've done that before where I've said like tag at the end of a chorus, but it's during the part where the vocals are already singing the tag. So it doesn't help anything to have that in there while they're already singing that part. Does that make sense? So that's why I like having the lead vocal cues in here to make sure that I do not distract the singer with my cues as best as I can it won't happen every time. Okay, so all of this is gonna be a learning game for sure. I made some mistakes while doing these cues, but there's two things in particular that I've found that have been really helpful. One, try not to talk over the vocals. 
And two, try to keep your cues as rhythmic as possible. So most of the time, if it works, I try to do a four count. All in, ready, go. Or with my cues. Verse two, ready, sing. Stop on one, three, four, stop. Little cues like that are just a way to keep it a lot easier because then you hear the rhythm and it's a lot easier to know when you're supposed to be doing what you're being cued to do. So try to keep it as rhythmic as possible. And again, one of the most distracting things is if you're trying to sing to hear verse two, ready, go, while you're trying to sing can be really distracting. So I really try to make sure that I'm not talking over when the singing is happening. So the pre-chorus going in the chorus is you better rock your body now. Every, you, there's there's really no pause because the, the end of the pre-chorus is on ends on beat three and then the pickup on the chorus is on beat four there's not really a spot in there that i can really say chorus in ready go so instead what i did is just on the end of three i say chorus just so again at least everyone's on the same structure sounds like this chorus so you know it, as it's not always going to work that way sometimes it's even harder to get your vocal cues in there. I just try to stick with those two rules as best as I can. Try not to give cues over lead vocal parts and try to keep your cues as rhythmic as possible. And also very important, make sure whatever device that you use to record those cues is set the same at every single time that you go to record. I use this mic. I know the exact setting on my Apollo interface. I have a preset specifically saved for that. That way you have all your cues and stuff like that are at the same level and use a little bit of compression as well to make sure that everything's about the same level. One of the bands I play in, we have four different people who have recorded, you know, those cues. Some of them are blaringly loud and other times I can't even hear the cues. Make sure that you're always at that same level every time that you record. Doing that, you are going to have to find where your balance is of the click and the cues. Because again, using this method, unless if you do multi-track outputs, which is different, but using this method, your click and your cues are going to be on the same channel. So it is going to be a balance of how loud you want the cues to be and how loud you want the click to be. With my setting, I have one drummer who says that my cues are too loud and the other two drummers that I play with, they said that they're just right. So it's up to you to find where that balance is with your band. Remember at the beginning, I left these extra two measures up here. So now what I'm going to do is in the first two measures, I say the name of the song and that gives and that gives us the tempo. And then in this measure, I'm going to cue in who starts. So here's what I would actually record. Everybody, drums in, ready, go. And I always try to leave it in groups of four. It's not always going to be that way with like a pickup note. I try to do four if I can. Okay, so for this, for cueing in the songs, this is up to you. I personally like two measures. However, another band that I play in, they want super fast transitions. They want them to be super fast. Staying alive, all in, go. So it's like one measure. Power of love, go. Doom, doom. So even that pickup note, power of love, go. Four, one. They want them really fast. That's up to you on how fast you want to do that. I personally have settled on the two measure rule. If a song has a pickup note, I will still do the name of the song in the first one and then i'll say what the pickup note is on the second one and then the third measure is used for that pickup note so for an example all the small things so that comes in on the end of three so my actual cue for that is all the small things in on the end of three one two three that's how I do it with a pickup note. If the song has a really slow tempo, we do Crazy by Patsy Cline, that song is insanely slow. So if I did Crazy all in, I mean, I don't even want to finish filming that because that's how long that is. So instead for something like that, I'll say Crazy without a click, Crazy all in, ready, go. So that way you still hear the tempo, you know, of the song, but then it doesn't take up a huge amount of time at the beginning. I try to keep it under five seconds of cue before the song starts. So that's up to you. I gave you some options. Do what's best for your band. Okay, so once the cues are made, this is actually a really important step, is I'm going to click this track right here, and it's going to select everything. And I'm going to either right click, or you can do Command J to join all of the tracks together. And it will ask to create a new one. Why am I doing that? You'll see why. So now let's put them all together. And this is the only way that this next step works is I'm going to hit control X. And this is going to remove the silence. You're going to have to mess with the threshold yourself with your settings. But I find that negative 30 works best. 
and now it has trimmed out all of the silence in here. The thing about this is that sometimes like, you know, I'll have like, it'll leave something like this. It'll leave like a little spot right here. And that's just like me taking a breath or something, you know, in, in this section of the song that can be incredibly distracting. So now what I'll do is I'll go through here. And for some reason, you know, the threshold didn't capture this one. So I'll delete that. If you know, it left a little bit too much at the end of this one, I'll delete that. I'll just clean it up. It's really distracting to hear, you know, in our ears, because then you're like, oh, a cue is coming, but then, you know, nothing happens. So I make sure to remove all of the sounds that are not my cues saying verse two, ready, go and stuff like that. So that's really helpful. Okay, so now that all of my cues, my instructions of the structure of the song are in there, we can just delete the lead vocals, right? We don't need all of those. Well, not really. There's actually one more reason why that's in here. I'll remove all of them except for the first couple of words in each verse. So I don't need it for, for this song. I don't need it for this intro, but this verse right here, I'm going to save that part. Here's verse two, and that's it. I'm going to leave just those two for this song, and I'm going to put a fade on them. So the shortcut for this is shift control and then drag, and it'll put the fade on there. So this is what we'll hear in our ears. Rest. Oh my God, we're back again. Go. And then you don't hear anything else with the vocals. So I don't know about you guys, but for me, when I'm singing, if I can get the first just few lines of like the verse, I remember the rest from there. Where I get, you know, like a brain fart is if I'm like, oh, how does this verse start? Once I get just those first two or three words, I'm ready to go and I'm fine. Usually I remember how the chorus goes. It's always just those verses just going, wait, how does this one start? A song like Wagon Wheel. Wagon Wheel has three verses. I still, to this day, how many times have I played that song? I have to remember heading down south, um, running from the cold. Actually, I had to think about it there. Heading down south, running from the cold. Ah, oh, damn it. What's the third one? Walking to the south. Yeah, I literally forgot it right there while I'm trying to do this video. Headed down south. The next one starts with running from the cold. Then the third one is walking to the south. Literally, I forgot it while doing this video, even while scripting it out. For some reason, I don't know what it is about that song. I just can't remember how each verse starts. That's why I like leaving just that first part, even just that karaoke version. So in my ear, for some reason, I forget then that karaoke version says headed down south and then I can go, oh, from the land of the pine. Just having those first cues are incredibly helpful and just in case if you forget a certain part in the song. But sometimes I'll use this for a bridge. Whatever you're forgetting or whatever you just need just a little bit help remembering, that can be really helpful to have these cues in there. So if you do plan to use stereo or multi-track outputs, you're going to want to export each of these by themselves. So you would solo drums and then command B and bounce it out or logic actually has file export all tracks as audio files so you can bounce them all into stems so you would get a file for each one of these that is if you do plan to use multi-tracking but again I'm doing the easy method which is where you're going to export just one file so now what you want to do is you want to mute anything that you don't need so I perform live with drums and bass so I don't need the drums and bass just use those in here just for a reference while I was making these tracks. So mute anything that you don't want and then make sure that you trim the ending. So many times I've exported a file and there's like three minutes of silence at the end. So make sure you set your ending marker properly. So I actually get it really tight actually. At the end I always do a fade and I get it just right there at the very end because I don't want a bunch of dead time at the end. So it helps transition a little bit better. Now, here's a big mistake that that happens a lot. So the shortcut is Command B to export. You can also go up to File, Bounce, Project or Selection. So if you accidentally have, so let's say I accidentally clicked this drum session right here. See how it selected the file? In Logic, if you do that, you can see that the starting point of the bounce is at about five measures, which is where the drums come in on this audio file right here. So make sure that you've clicked off and then hit bounce and it will truly do the start to the end. I've made that mistake before where there's no counting and the tracks just start by accident. Now for me, I bounce to high quality MP3. If you really want WAV files, it's really up to you. I just use high quality MP3s. If you have the space to use WAV files, go for it. I personally 
personally just have stuck with high quality MP3s and saved so much disk space. Okay, so here's something a little bit different for me. So the band that I play in with my wife, we can either perform as a two piece, a three piece or a four piece. If we perform as a four piece, we have a live drummer and a live bass player. And then all the keys and violins and synth and stuff like that are in the tracks. If we perform as a three piece, we add the bass to the tracks, but we have a drummer live. And if we perform as a two piece, we actually have drums and bass in the backing tracks on top of everything else. And we perform the guitars and vocals live. I went over this in more detail in my video of why I'm pro backing tracks. I prefer to always play with a band if I can. Sometimes we get booked for, you know, a Sunday afternoon gig on a patio. There's not enough band space. There's not a budget for four piece band. So we'll perform as a two piece. Watch that video if you want to find out more about my opinions on why I do stuff like that. And then I'm just going to say this is just a thought. Every single person out there I think watching this video has dealt with douchey or flaky musicians. I guarantee as soon as I said that I bet you probably had someone in your mind that you thought of specifically when I said douchey or flaky musician. Bad musicians can just suck your soul dry man. The, especially with the, how awesome it is to play music with great musicians it makes you really appreciate the good musicians that you play with so you cherish those people a lot more for sure after dealing with so many bad people just an option just something to think about and this is why it's also nice to have like all the parts you know exported when you are doing your tracks if you're worried that your bass player is going to get into a fight with their significant other and not come to the show because of it or if you're worried that your piano player is going to be drunk yet again and not show up or you know, you know we've all dealt with this stuff it might be smart to have a version that has their parts in the backing track. Even for practice, you know, a lot of times musicians flake on practice. That's usually what happens the most, more than shows. So then you can still do a practice with the bass in there when your bass player, you know, says, I'm not showing up today. I got into a fight with my girlfriend or whatever, you know, happened. I'm not picking on bass players particularly, but, but you know what I mean. So having that as an option, just, just something to think about. Just having it as a fail safe in case if you need it. I guess you probably shouldn't tell your bass player that you have that because then they'll never show up to practice. If they're like, oh, they have it in the tracks, it's fine. If you have, you know, a bass player that I've dealt with before. I personally would rather perform just as a three piece instead of a four piece. If it meant removing that fourth person who just sucks your soul dry, I would rather do that personally. Cherish the good musician. Dealing with the bad ones makes you really appreciate the good ones. But having a fail safe, if you are dealing with those bad ones right now, might not be the worst option. Okay, so now for importing. So you need to get the files onto your tablet. So for iPad, you can just right click, share, airdrop, and you know, it'll say your iPhone. So I can click that and import it there. The other option that you have is you could, you know, in your finder, you go to your phone, you click your phone, and then go to files and then drop it into whichever one you're going to use it with. So I have used SoundCue. I've used stage tracks and I've used multi tracker. So you would just drag and drop it into wherever you need it to go. You can also just use the music player as well. Uh, this is what I have as a backup in case if one of my apps doesn't work. Here's all of our tracks in just a music player. That way you don't even need to use an app. That's completely fine. One of my bands actually does it that way. For me, I like having an app or the one that I found most recently is stage tracks three. And I'm working on a video for that one. So I'm going to go with that for the sake of this video, just because that's what I'm working on right now. So I'll drag that in there from the files menu. Okay, so for connecting to gear, so you do need the splitter cable. So plug the 3.5 millimeter end into the iPad. And then you have these two TS cables quarter inch, most of the time you should plug these into a direct box. I like this one by art audio. Another one that my band uses is the radial one if you do want to spend the money on that. But I like this one, both are linked down below if you do want to buy them. You also can do this with two separate DIs, but it's just easier just to have a dual DI that's just for your tracks. So the tracks side will go to input one and the click and cue side will go to input two. Remember the left has all the tracks and the right has all the cues. Generally white is left and then a red one goes to the right. So now XLR will go to front of house to be mixed and then click and cues will go to your own in your monitor systems or just to your drummer or to your digital mixer for everyone to mix their own ears. If you do use your own ears, you would plug both of these into your splitter and you know, and then it would split and go to front of house and go to your in ears. If you don't know how to do that, I have a whole video walking you through how to run your own 
phone in your monitors as a band. So check that out. Just another option. If you do want to save money, you can get one wireless in your monitor system for cheap, like the Phoenix Pro PTM 11. I'll link to that down below as well. And then you just get multiple receivers all set to the same channel so that everyone gets the click and cues to their ears. You guys would just plug in clicks and cues to that. You would get those to your ears and then you would use stage wedges for the rest of the sound. I did that when we were first using ears and tracks and it works for sure. Before we go though, just three tips I want to give you. One, always have a backup, even if it's just on your phone and you run it from, you know, a music player or a second computer if you have it or a second iPad if you have it. Always have some sort of a backup. You know, we have phones in our pocket that literally can do these backing tracks. I have three backups for my stuff. Second tip, do two or three test tracks. So make, you know, two or three backing tracks, bring them to rehearsal and see how it sounds. You'll find out from those first two or three tracks, you're like, oh, I, I mixed the vocals too high. Or, you know, my cues are way too quiet and the click is blaring loud. If you make two or three just as a test run, then you only have to fix two or three tracks instead of if you make 12 the first time and then you go and you realize your mistake, you have to re-edit. It will be a learning experience. Like I said, a lot of what I went over in this video is me telling you what mistakes not to make that I have made. And three, now that you're performing the backing tracks, so now you can use, you know, like MIDI programming. So when you go into the chorus, it changes to your string pad and the distortion goes on on the guitar because, you know, it's going to come in at the same part every time since you are playing the backing tracks. You could also consider having a light show that syncs to your music now. Now that everyone's playing to click and backing tracks, you can have lights that sync to it. You can also have video that syncs to the music as well. So I do have videos on that on my channel. Might be something worth considering. Again, I have videos like that on my channel for you to check out. And that is it. Congratulations, you made it to the end of this video. So I hope you guys found this video helpful. If you did, if you made it to the end of this video, I'm assuming you found it helpful. Please just do me a favor, hit the thumbs up button. This video took forever to put together. It really does help feed the YouTube algorithm and help support the channel. I would definitely appreciate it if you took the time to hit the thumbs up on this video. I have a whole playlist on backing tracks as well as a playlist on in-ear monitors. So I'll post those at the end screen as well as down in the description down below. Again, everything that I've talked about as far as gear in this video, I will also link down below in the description. So that's basically it. Again, hope this helped you guys out. Check out some of those other videos by clicking the links on your screen now. Don't forget to follow me on my social media pages at Scott Ewell Music on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I hope this helped you guys out. Thank you guys again for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. So going, what the f are the words?